Hello, good afternoon, uh, SSAAA NZ 2022. Thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Milan Merrick Marcuza, and the abstract that you read is from my PhD research on vertical video titled The Evolving Aesthetics of the Moving Image in Vertical Video Online. Uh, when I started gathering uh, observations on vertical video in 2015 and 16, I was still working as a full-time content producer in the TV industry and as a freelance cinematographer. Um, it is natural that any industry um, will change with the advent of technology, and I already witnessed a shift from um, analog to digital workflows at the beginning of my career in 2000s, but this time around it was different. Um, because proliferation of online distribution channels and uh, portable video recording technology once again affected the, the industry in a very profound way. TV station where I used to work uh, was one of the late uh, adopters of new technology, um, as well as new distribution outlets. And interestingly enough, the pushback wasn't only coming from baby boomers in senior management, but quite often you know, from a much uh, younger crew, younger generation. And uh, when I started academic research in 2018, I identified multiple studies looking into evolution of user-generated vertical content, but only a handful probing the opinion of working professionals uh, towards vertical content. And I decided to fill that gap with this research. As a methodology, um, um, I chose um, several steps um, because my, as you could see, my principal thesis question was quite complex. Uh, involving how the framing, filming technology, and choices of distribution platform influence media professional aesthetic decisions when creating vertical content. Is it possible to repurpose the footage? Is it possible to reuse the same equipment that already exists, the same studios, that kind of stuff, and of course, the same skills? So in the first step, um, I did like a comparative content analysis of online media texts. Samples, key samples uh, were from YouTube Vivo channel and Netflix. Um, so I look basically at the differences between the vertical music video is the same version of vertical music video widescreen and excuse me widescreen and vertical version of uh, same music videos and Netflix vertical previews uh, available in the Netflix browser. Uh, I basically dissected the dominant two D and three D features um, in this step. Um, and in the following methodological step, I did a semi-structured interviews with uh, film and TV professionals from a various geographical markets. And then I move on to the practical component. Uh, basically, these previous first two methodological steps inform my decisions during the practical component, which was creating four artifacts, two vertical um, single take um, music videos and two widescreen single take music videos. videos. Uh, basically comparing the differences between them while filming a single subject, like a solo performer, in this case, the jazz, uh, jazz sax player and a multi-piece band. The last step was repurposing of the existing footage. So I uh, basically took a 16 by nine um, original footage and re-edited the whole movie into a vertical slimmer frame, one by two frame. And from that step, and after that step, I created the last artifact number six, which was a vertical trailer in the style of Netflix um, previews. So why using um, applied media aesthetics? Well, I chose the Herbert Zettel's media aesthetics as a comprehensive method to examine a number of elements in the media text because it's not an abstract model. And I could use to analyze the various video forms of moving images, but even more important, the applied media aesthetics also includes and covers the process of production, the synthesis of media, not only the analysis. From the following slides, um, we're not going to have a lot of time to go in depth, but you could see that from um, you could see on this screen how um, what I'm kind of talking about, and if I compare the asymmetry of the frame, figure ground relationships, ecological closure that it's coming from frame a hand. And if you compare that to the vertical screen, you see that it's quite different. Uh, you know, the figure becomes more stable. There is, there is less lateral space on the sides, that kind of stuff. And I did really, really in-depth analysis of all these elements, extend that to the uh, three-dimensional field. Uh, you could see on the screen saying, um, you know, presence or absence of these things, sections of the shot, secondary framing, volume duality. So this was quite 
um, involved step. It took me a lot of time to do this, but I think the, the payoff was really good because I could, in a way I could quantify the aesthetics, right? That was, that was my goal um, when I started with this step. Um, and um, I also, along the way, reflected what all this kind of lack of, you know, wide uh, lack of space on a horizontal axis, what that actually means for our media professionals. You know, can talent moves more freely along the, the axis, um, along the depth of the shot instead of moving laterally, you know, left and right. Um, it was also interesting to see um, the absence of some camera movements, especially like a wide descriptive camera pans, but there was definitely a lot more movement along the depth of the shot. And the following questions comes to mind, like um, why would the content creator make such compromises, right? Why would the content creator use a vertical screen in the first place, professional content creator? And the answer is um, if, you know, media professionals want to reach um, a global audience these days, it's not possible to ignore the ubiquity of a smartphones and the Im immense reach um, of, of some of the online distribution platforms. From this slide, you can actually see some of the main statistics that nearly three quarters of the world we use um, just their smartphones to access the internet. And then the last one that uh, majority of users are holding smartphone in the upright position. So that was a key for my research and that was a really great kind of um, incentive to dig deeper. Um, because if you think about it from the next slide, I just want to give you an overview of some of well-established um, aspect ratio in the history of cinema and TV. And um, if you compare that to the next slide where, you know, for in cinematography, a standing human body is a standard reference for a shot scale. And the medium shot of standing human body housed in the vertical frame renders a very stable composition, but there is little space for anything else, as you could see from here. There's a little space for other um, person or object or you know mise-en-scene elements, unlike widescreen that you could see um, different versions of widescreen here. And if we go back, this is like the original 35 millimeter. Uh, four by three aspect ratio, then well established in TV and broadcast industry, 16 by nine, and then some of the wider aspect ratio common in theaters these days. But uh, once again, as you could see, the the the, the amount of negative space, uh, the other elements, the volume duality, the space for camera movements, the space for talent movement, it, it's quite, quite different than what you have in the vertical frame. And from the following slide, you, you could see how that actually works in reality. These are screenshots from uh, one of my, um, uh, two of my key examples from the very beginning of chapter number four. And the principal difference is in a production value, uh, camera movements, and just the complexity of mise-en-scene. Something that I, that I learned pretty quickly is that the vertical versions of these music videos are way more simpler because it's not possible to ignore that that you know that slimmer frame housed once again um, medium um, shot of a human body or something a bit wider um, is much much easier to produce that stable composition and a lot of artists uh, decided to use that potential a lot of artists decided to create alternative versions of their widescreen music videos basically to reach the mobile audience and use these vertical videos as a boost, right? Um, as pretty affordable boost released a few weeks later than the principal widescreen version. Um, what else? I also covered in the research how graphical user interface uh, might affect the perception of vertical shot, and that's visible from, and that is uh, obvious in the examples of Netflix vertical previews. I don't know how much you can see from this screenshot, but it is an actually overlay. There's like a like a gradient mask that basically holds the subtitles, uh, uh, closed captions, not subtitles, and something that it's 
meant to be on a theatrical screen. Um, if you if you recall the, one of the previous slides, something that are very wide, like 235 or 16 by 9 to that matter. And now once it's housed in a very skinny one by two frame with the gradient mask, with the closed captions, it's actually quite different perception. Um, and that, in an essence, means that the content creator needs to adapt the footage aesthetics for the aspect ratio uh, directly affecting technical and aesthetic decisions. Um, screenshot over here is from a YouTube Vivo music video of Taylor Swift, Delicate. And that's another great example how A-list artists look to produce music videos resembling user-generated content. And that's basically because they want to harvest that sense of honesty, unaltered account of event, commonly associated uh, with the vertical uh, content on the internet. This is another way to illustrate the same point. And if you take a look at um, the distribution of um, shot scale, um, or even more importantly, just a total number of edit points, right? This is 11 key examples, and this is uh, 11 key examples from YouTube and 11 key examples from Netflix, Netflix trailers. As you could see, the editors of vertical versions use only a half of the shots, 50%, uh, uh, even more. I mean, even even less than um, the dif the difference is pretty impressive, right? To 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 edit eleven widescreen music videos, editors use a thousand, you know, a hundred, uh, one thousand, one hundred and seventy four shots. In contrast, only five hundred and twelve. And the same goes for Netflix. Like the third, only a third of the shots were used to illustrate the same running length. So that's quite an interesting way to think about it because. There's definitely something that's happening here in terms of simplifi simplified mise-en-scene, simplified um, blocking. As you could see here, there is complete absence of vista shots, like a very wide uh, shots, and definitely less widescreen shots in, um, in vertical versions. And that number, that difference goes um, on the account of medium and medium close-ups. In the last methodological step, um, as you could see from this slide, um, it was clear that uh, to me that repurposing of footage, it's not just a matter of a simple crop, as you could see from here. Okay, here's a wide screen, here's a horizontal. Let's find the median uh, ground that it's a square frame, doesn't really work like that. I dissected um, uh, several key scenes um, uh, from the short fiction film Lost. It's a character-driven drama, so it was working really well uh, uh, for this matter. There was a four characters in the movie, but for most of the time, the story revolves about the character of, of uh, mother. And if you think about it, this is a static shot, a static kind of, uh, it's a static shot of, of uh, three people moving towards the camera. And if you try to do, if you try to house the same composition in the vertical shot in a very skinny one by two aspect ratio, aiming to, to kind of reach the Netflix audience, it works quite different because at any given point, you cannot see all three characters of the screen on the screen, and that changed the character uh, dynamics quite a lot. So yeah, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to stop here, uh, but I just want to add that it was a good time to release the 2022 is a good moment to release this kind of study because i did have my doubts at the beginning how relevant my thesis will be you know four years from from 2018 but now in 2022 there are new hubs for vertical content such as tiktok and they uh, because because the platform grew immensely in the past four years there is a lot more vertical uh, use the generative vertical content as well as professional vertical content. And I would like to now expand my research looking for a specific traits, how vertical content evolved on a, on a different platforms, like YouTube, Netflix, and TikTok, for that matter. So yeah, I'm going to stop here. Uh, thank you. And I'm looking forward to our discussion and your questions. Cheers.